Okay, <clears throat> the clock is 10.30, so I guess it's time to uh, start up with the <clears throat> last part of uh, this first session. Uh, <clears throat> we will now have uh, three more talks uh, focusing on uh, and explore the place uh, before we break up for lunch uh, at 12. Uh, <clears throat> the first uh, talk uh, now is uh, by Mats Williamson from uh, Mu Consult DK. Uh, he will give us a talk about the, uh, <clears throat> the chalk play, which is very underexplored in the at least here in Norway. Uh, Mats is an expert in the chalk play and has extensive experience within exploration, production, desert characterization, and field development planning. He uses his experience within these fields to advise companies and authorities within exploration, development plan audits, and CO2 storage. So uh, thank you very much uh, for being here, Mats. You can uh, please share your presentation. And yeah. Yes, thank you. Do you yes. see the presentation now? Yes, we see it. Good. That is excellent. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I will give a talk on, on chalk. And I can already see from the participants list that there are a couple of you who have probably know uh, all of what I'm going to tell this morning. Uh, but there probably will also be some who, who can pick up a few things that uh, may change the view on, on the chalk. Uh, I'll first refer to, to the title. Uh, I say prolific. Uh, why is that? That is because the North Sea chalk have, has been produced economically for, for half a century or more, a little more actually, and it was uh, the first fields in, in the North Sea were actually chalk fields. Um, and I say underexplored, and that is because um, most, of, most of the chalk fields on the Norwegian continental shelf, they are the, the big Giants, the the high porosity chalk giants in in south, um, and I would be surprised if there are not any occurrences with lower porosity, but still economically viable. Um, and then the low porosity, low permeability part, um, that is actually the key element, and that is probably what uh, I'll spend most of the time on in this talk. Uh, the the consequences for how to address the chalk and how to to work with it. In the background, you see a picture of Stevens Clint, where where the chalk in the in the lower part is actually accessible. Here, covered by by Danian, uh, the the Ecofisk formation on top. So the almost in the middle of the cliff, you will have the KT boundary. I'll tell you about uh, the constituents of the chalk, how it's deposited, um, what type of sediment it is, and something about the physics uh, back to the low perm uh, quality of the chalk, which also influences the fluid levels um, and some impact on how the seismic response is, is seen in chalk. And then finally, something about the development of chalk fields and, and where it may be found on, on the Norwegian continental shelf. I'll start out with a few points here um, and maybe starting with a, the with a picture uh, in the lower right. That is not a chalk discovery. Uh, I put it there because uh, Chalk discoveries rarely lend themselves to this um, very visible uh, success quality test, the relatively masculine uh, exploration show off with a huge test. Normally, when we test chalk fields, we test them very quietly, downhole with a small sample device between dual packers. Uh, otherwise, we can't trick out the, the, the liquids nor, nor the pressure, really. Um, so that was just to highlight that um, 
we should not expect this, and therefore also there are some other elements in the expiration in the, in the standard expiration workflow that may be different. Uh, and just for the curiosity here, on, on top of it, we have Stevens Clint again, with uh, a, a, a couple of years ago visiting it with your next speaker, Sissel. Um, to the points here, the Norwegian chalk giants, I've talked about that, uh, they may not be good analogs. I think we we have to look for something else. Uh, otherwise, they they are so visible in the seismic, they would have been found, I would assume. Um, and then the, the quality of the chalk and the peculiarities really calls for very close integration with, between disciplines quite early on in the exploration phase. Uh, and compared to many other uh, plays for the chalk, you actually have to in involve, actually involve the reservoir engineer from day one to get a feel for uh, the next part here, the point three, the the volumes and the the um, productivity estimates of, of the chalk. Um, and then also, it often calls for relatively advanced wells. May not always be very advanced, but but often. Uh, and I know that is not rocket science at all, but it sometimes requires that we very early in the in the exploration phase, in order to be able to evaluate what we have encountered, have to involve specialists outside our our own circles. Now diving into the material itself, the chalk. The chalk, it's a, a mainly calcitic pelagic ooze sediment. On the right here, you see uh, some algae coccolids or coccolidophias when they are actually collected still sitting together. Uh, at the bottom, you please, oh, you please note the scale here, 10 micron. So, it, they are quite small, and the individual coccolids are in the order of up to 10, a little more than 10 micron, but the platelets, as you see on the left, are down to just one micron or so. And that has obviously an impact on the on the pore throat size between the, the pores. Um, also, it's important that it's calcitic because it, that has an impact on the diagenesis. There's a little clay, and then there are some microfossils, mainly foraminifera in the Danish and Norwegian part. But when getting a bit further south to to Germany, Holland, and, and France, in, in and in parts of UK, you will find a more higher proportion, you could say, of of skeletal elements of of macrofossils. You may note the picture here. It is actually very porous. It's more than 40% porosity this year. So even though it's very tiny grains, there's a lot of room between them. And that is actually possible to get a lot of it out. Um, the next one here, touching upon the deposition and, and, and the preservation of porosity. Uh, to the left, you see the depositional environments. As I said, it's a pelagic sediment. The coccolids drizzle down in various ways, though. Uh, but a lot of the chalk that we find have actually been moved around, either just a little, and it's almost autochthonous, or maybe a little. Uh, but uh, some of it also moves around in, in actual slides or slumps, uh, debris flows, dependent on the consistency and, and how compacted, uh, dewatered the material is when it's when it's moving. Uh, that has a direct impact on the process preservation and to some degree also on the on the permeability, porosity permeability uh, correlations. If we go to the figure on the right, the compaction depth, there's a, on on the left part, you see the bioturbation going down and we have the depths as it's buried, it loses 
porosity and it loses permeability. It's not to be to really take specific note of the, of the numbers, but around two to three kilometers, we get to a porosity where it's not really relevant as a reservoir anymore. It has often chalk has to be a little more than 30 uh, percentage porosity to be a, a, a proper reservoir and, and, and with flow capabilities that are of, of, of commercial interest. Uh, but even though it's, it may be buried deeper, there are some things that can hold back the compaction and that is uh, overpressure. So here shown the pore pressure and uh, hydraulic pressure, lithostatic pressure. So if there is an overpressure that kicks in before the material is compacted too much, that can help keep the porosity open and the pore throats at, at a reasonable size. Also, when we uh, look, we start introducing hydrocarbons in the system, that will also preserve uh, both porosity and permeability. Moving on to the impact of, of, of this low uh, small grain material. On the yellow figure, you see a porosity versus permeability here showing this is for, for Danish chalk core material, but regardless, it, it works for, for all the chalk. They are, may not be exactly the same numbers, but the trend is the same. And the trend is that it ha really has to be, as I, said, as I said, around 30 or more, a bit more, to have permeabilities that, that work properly. We have, it, it is it is becoming difficult when we get below 0.1 millidarcy. Uh, but as you see, the tor formation has a higher porosity, a higher permeability versus porosity than the ecofisk formation and the lower Cretaceous, where the Marley chalks occur and they are also developed in, in the Danish sector at least. Um, they still work as a reservoir, but they have an even lower uh, permeability versus porosity trend and following that during burial. These very poor, small uh, pore throats, they, the, the effect of that is that uh, the, the water uh, is sort of take, pulled up into the low, low perm uh, rock. And therefore we, we, we work with a free water level by actually having a, a full water saturation, 100% water above that free water level up until the entry pressure where the oil actually is, is capable of moving the water out and getting into it, into the rock. The rock, the chalk is often water wet and therefore it, it, it is difficult for, for the oil to get in. But when it's in, it, it's there and we can get it out again relatively easily, also with quite effective uh, water, uh, water sweep. If we look to the lower right, you again see something about the, the relative permeability and that is quite important. That comes on the next slide also, we come back to that. Uh, water may move around, but at, at lower water saturations, it, it can be difficult to, to get it out. And there's, as you see on the, on the left side, uh, irreducible water saturation, which clings to, to, the, to the grains. Uh, but also there's a threshold to how much water, how much oil we can get out and when the oil is actually movable and can move around. And that has an impact also on, on the accumulations. And therefore, it is not as in, in high perm reservoirs where we can just drill a well and assume a, a flat free water level. So therefore, we may drill a well dry, but at the same depth, we could have drilled into the oil accumulation. These tilted free water levels can either be due to water movements in the, in the aquifer, which pulls the oil with it due to pressure differences, 
but it may also be slightly more advanced and that comes back to the um, to the relative permeability of for for oil if the oil comes into the chalk during uh, compaction during burial and the surrounding rock is compacted further then the oil accumulation may be sort of arrested or frozen and it cannot move out into the now more uh, compacted chalk and therefore structural tilts can actually occur and you can have very very steep tilts of of the accumulation so therefore the it, it can be quite difficult to get the volumes right and to predict where is uh, actually hydrocarbons and what is the tilt of the free water level or the tilt of the oil water contact. So predictability can be a challenge and that is where we have to join forces between explorationists and development geoscientists and reservoir engineers uh, and obviously a lot of other disciplines. But to, to, to start modeling uh, in geocellular models quite early on for chalk fields, even in the exploration phase, in order to address and 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 get the ranges correct or as 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 representative as possible. When we talk about the acoustics, um, that helps a lot. There's a very good relationship between impedance, acoustic impedance and porosity as shown here. So we can make relatively easily get porosity models out of absolute acoustic impedance as shown here in the in the PGS survey. And also the VPVS can help us differentiate between oil and, and water in uh, as, as the fluid response. So that also works for chokes. <clears throat> About the Techno uh, completion technologies. We here have um, long horizontal wells. We often have to use that, or we have to frack them with either sand prop fracks or other types of fracks to expand, or you could say, uh, yeah, get to establish a, a larger surface area between the well and the reservoir. Uh, in the lower left, there's the, an example of, of how Halfdan field in, in Denmark was developed with the uh, fast concept where it's a fracture alignment sweep technology. And the idea is that we have injectors parallel to producers and they are switching all next to each other. One producer, one injector, one producer. Start with when we drill an injector, we start with producing it a little to make sure that the geomechanical or uh, field is actually aligned with the orientation of the well. And then we pressure it up and it fracks vertically and build a, a wall of, of water injector so we can actually sweep the water out. Uh, to the to the producers. It is uh, things like that that is possible. On the right I've taken, it is an old picture, but it still shows the, the, the important element here. The Danfield was start producing in, in 72 and it took 15 years before we really got it up in, in production. And that was by invention and introducing new technologies. It was horizontal wells, it was water injectors, it was long, ho longer horizontal wells and fracked wells and, and, and sand prop fracked wells and so. So eventually we had the Kyliner uh, acid stimulated long, long wells, which then got the productivity up. Um, in the red line here, you see the production acceleration for the half dan field, the lower left fast here, fast development. That shows you something about timing and that it doesn't have to take 20 years before you have payback from a chalk field. And I think that is important to realize and to, to believe in uh, when going out exploring for chalk fields. And lastly, a 
a little information, a, a little note here on the Cretaceous formations encountered on the uh, Norwegian continental shelf. The Cretaceous formations, the Tor, the Harode, and then Jorsalfara formations, and where they have been encountered in wells. And compared to how many encounters there have been, there are quite few developments. So may, there may be something to go for here. Uh, and just repeating the, the four notes from start, don't use the old, big, wonderful, even though they are wonderful, uh, giants in the south. They are probably not good analogs for, for, for this area. Um, don't forget to include the reservoir engineer early on and, and, and start building models even before you would normally do for, for a clastic field. And make sure that the volume ranges are, are representative, including the upside. It's not always uh, easy to to visualize the, the upside without having this uh, integration between, between disciplines. And then don't forget about the spatial trajectories and so. Thanks for your attention and good luck out there. Thank you very much, Mats. A very interesting uh, talk of the chalk, and uh, hopefully we get more uh, more, uh, more wells on that uh, play in the near future. Uh, <clears throat> we have time for uh, some questions. Uh, one here: uh, many structures with chalk on NCS are near hydrostatic pressure. Is there hope for these? It depends on 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 the porosity permeability. I would say. Um, if permeability have been preserved, that could be, it could be possible to get it out, but it may require uh, then water injection. The idea, as I mentioned, the water injection is very effective in, in chalks because the chalk effectively sucks the water and expels the, 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 the oil. Uh, another uh, element is that there is a, a there, I mean, we do also have gas fields in the chalk um, and they require less permeability and, and and to some extent less pressure or can maintain their own pressure uh, more. But I, I, I do agree there are also some uh, pressure-wise dead occurrences. Um, uh... Is there any potential, do you think, for having uh, uh, pure stratigraphic traps in the in this play, and not uh, four-way closures, but uh, but pure stratigraphic? Yes, yes, there, there definitely is, um, and and they can actually be of two types. I've, I've seen two types, modeled two types. Uh, one is where, as as I described earlier, where the porosity is lost and the rel perm is lost in the surrounding rock. So you have a, a, a high porosity reservoir rock lying in tombstone chalk and that can be moved around and, and that, that can be developed. So there that doesn't go anywhere and, and it, it doesn't need anything but the chalk as a seal, the low perm. The other thing is that the, the rel perm itself may actually uh, uh, force accumulations to move so slowly that we can produce them while they are on the move. Yeah, <clears throat> so kind of a dynamic trap. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. because right. of the low, low permeability and particularly the low rail perm. Yeah. Uh, another question there, uh, will more extensive fracturing uh, stimulation comp compensate for the low perm? The perm is so low anyhow, so we need contribution from fractures anyhow. Of course, some of the accumulations are fractured already, and, and I didn't go into that. That's a, a whole separate ball game for, for, for the low perm chalk. But um, there are different ways of, of uh, stimulating and, and fracking. And I think the, it is evolving now, and we now have the fishbone structure wells also, which also is not another way of, of, of getting direct contact with a larger so part of the rock and therefore the surface area. But I would say some of the some of the fields there is a 
uh, a documented permeability enhancement that we can't really see as big fractures, but it must be something like small mini frac systems that are actually present in the rock. Um, okay. If that helps. Uh, can the fracking process mitigate any issues with vertical heterogeneity and the reservoir quality distribution, or is well path position critical for max recovery? Um, the, the the big fracks can uh, it is possible to frack through low, low perm intervals, and the whole uh, story about cyclic development of porosity in chalk is for another day. But there are often particularly in the lower Cretaceous, there are low perm intervals and, and with the frac, we can pass those and link up to several high perm layers above each other. So thanks for, for that question, Mark. That was good. <clears throat> yes, uh, <clears throat> there's no further questions here. So I think uh, we then uh, say thank you. Uh, thank you a lot to Mats. Uh,